Welcome to Little News. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us. Labor's devastating defeat in the British elections leaves us with a lot of questions. How is it that people polled supporting Labor's positions like higher tax on its highest earners, renationalization of energy and rail, Labor's Green New Deal, as our guest Rachel Shabby pointed out in her article for The Nation. The establishment Democrats in the United States are using Labor's defeat as a reason we need a centrist candidate to defeat Trump. What will five years of Tories do to Britain? And how is it linked to this worldwide movement of the populist right riding high on the failure of neoliberalism, as well as a left that seems to have lost its potency in many places? Tarek Ali joined us last week, arguing that Labor should have let Brexit happen then fight it, but not stop it, and watch the unraveling over the next year and make its fight then. Well, I look forward to hearing what our guest Rachel Shabi has to say about this. She writes for The Nation, The Guardian, The Independent, many other journals, and uh, her latest book is Not the Enemy, Israel's Jews from Arab Lands. And Rachel, wel welcome to The Real News. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed your most recent article in The Nation. Um, you covered a lot of ground. Um, and so, did you see this coming? I mean, as an activist and as a journalist, did you see this kind of devastating defeat on the horizon? And why do you think it happened? I think there were all sorts of reasons that were working um, alongside each other and created this sort of domino effect or snowball effect um, that resulted in this defeat. And it was a catastrophic defeat for Labour, that much is clear. It was a landslide victory for the Conservatives, um, who are a you know hard Brexit, hard right um, party now purged of its uh, moderate element. So Brexit, of course, completely changed Britain's political landscape. And in the years that it has um, gridlocked Parliament, um, three years, we've had since the um, referendum to leave the EU uh, by a 52% majority said, yes, we should leave. Um, it, has, it has jammed parliament and it has jammed politics and it's created a sense of frustration, but it has also created an atmosphere of a, essentially a culture war. Um, the uh, leave narrative was very much that the people's desire to leave the EU was being thwarted uh, by an array of saboteurs, um, parliament, uh, the judiciary, lefties, liberal snowflakes, the media, migrants, and Brussels bureaucrats. Um, so we, we, <laughs> we set a, up this, <laughs> it, was a, it was a long list and it kept growing, you know, through the years you think, oh, what, uh, them, them too? They're saboteurs as well? Okay. Um, so it created this narrative of a culture war. Um, and it also, we're looking at Boris Johnson's Conservative Party has become more extreme. It's become this very nativist, far-right um, party, uh, allied to far-right movements um, across Eastern Europe and indeed pals with your very own Donald Trump. Um, so they have used this authoritarian playbook of, you know, creating this climate of chaos, um, undermining liberal norms and institutions like parliament, like the judiciary, um, threatening the media, um, flooding the electoral campaign um, with fake news, with disinformation, which was designed, I think, not so much to spread lies as to create a sense of confusion over the truth. Um, so quite often, Labour campaigners on doorsteps across the country would hear not just that politicians were all the same, but that they're all liars, i.e. you can't trust any of them. Um, and, and that was the atmosphere into which uh, the Labour campaign was running. And it had plenty of flaws and it made plenty of mistakes, uh, but against that, sort of atmosphere, it was always going to be very tough. But, but uh, the, the contradictions here kind of are, are really huge. I mean, when you look at, as you wrote about, uh, other people have been talking about, um, that the, the polls show that most Britain, people in Britain believed in a higher tax on wage owners, if you wrote about um, renationalization of rail, uh, the new energy system, the Green New Deal, all of that, yet they voted conservative and against labor. So, and in working class districts, 
which just turned over completely. They either voted for uh, other people who wanted to remain or they voted for the conservatives, which led to a conservative victory in these staunch blue-collar, deindustrialized communities in the Midlands and north of England. So, so what, what, what is the heart of this contradiction? I mean, I think that people are really trying to parse that out. It seems to me that would be important to get to to understand how to counter it. I agree. It's really important to parse out what exactly went wrong. Um, in the initial polling and data crunching, what's coming out is that whether people were leave or remain, um, most people raised uh, the Labour leadership, Jeremy Corbyn, as a, as a reason, as a, a reason for not being able to vote Labour this time round. Um, I think to some extent that was about his leadership in itself. To some extent, it was also a proxy uh, for, for Brexit and the Labour Party's Brexit position, which was basically to try and straddle both sides and say, listen, we want to unite the country. Uh, we will have, we will put forward a, a, a deal uh, that puts British jobs and interests um, first, um, that protects the economy, and then we will put that to a referendum because we want everyone to come together. And actually, the country is in no mood for that. Um, the country is too polarised for that position, and it was seen as weak and sitting on the fence and it alienated both sides of the camp. Well, what do you think should have um, done then? I mean, it, I'm, I started to interrupt, but I mean, when, when, when I was in talk with Tarek Ali just the, last week, one of his suggestions was that Labour should have allowed um, Brexit to take place and then fought over the next couple of years to say, look what it's done to us, and then trying to build a majority to take on the government. I mean, what, what, what would have been the response that might have made sense? The reality is that um, Labour was going to lose support, whatever it did, because it is a combination of leave and remain voters. So whatever it did, it was going to alienate one side or the other. Um, I, my sense of it is that it, it, it's, it didn't do anything quickly enough. So for the last year, it was seen as dragging its heels and coming to a position very reluctantly. Jeremy Corbyn, who prior to the last couple of years had this brand of authenticity and credibility and not behaving like, you know, any other politician, right. um, had his brand damaged, essentially, by triangulating over this issue that, that people felt was so important and felt so deeply. So it compromised his own brand. And at the same time, the sluggishness and d d delay and indecisiveness meant that whatever position Labour took, it, 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 it took it and it got all the pain from it without any of the potential gain from it because it was too it was too slow and too late. So picking up on that thing, so the question is what happens now? You have five years, Britain has five years of Tory rule ahead of it. Very it's unclear how that's gonna be overturned at all. Um, it's part of this worldwide movement, as I talked about earlier, this pop populist right wing movement is kind of seizing control of governments across the globe. Um, talking about doing this deal with Trump's uh, government here in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, so what what strategically is happening? I mean, you look at the polls, as you wrote about, and other people have said that a majority of young people uh, under 46 uh, and um, and most and most communities of color in Britain went labor. So, I mean, when you put all that mixed together, what are the discussions and arguments taking place in Britain now among people who want to have a different kind of world? It's very interesting, as you say, that um, you know, young people is now defined as anyone under the age of 46. <laughs> 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 that's the age at which people start uh, supporting the Conservatives when you see the, the uh -huh. switch. Um, and, and, the, and there's a very good reason for that, which is that, you know, all the... There is an understanding post the financial crash of 2008, there is an understanding that this idea of letting the market do its thing while tinkering around the edges to mitigate the excesses, that system has failed. And it has failed most people, not just, you know, the very poor. It's something that everyone understands on an everyday basis, that um, life and their own economic well-being um, is precarious. There's a sense of insecurity and a sense of anxiety that most people have. So there's an understanding that that system cannot work, is not sustainable, and on top of that um, is perpetuating a now emergency 
of a climate crisis that desperately needs to be tackled. So that's why you're seeing so many young people under 46 um, support, uh, the, the vote for Labour and support these policies. And, and as you said earlier, these policies that, that Labour came up with, such as, you know, higher tax on the highest earners, such as renationalization of rail and energy companies, such as this, uh, green, the, the equivalent of a Green New Deal, which is a essentially a jobs creation program as a means of tackling climate crisis. And one of the devastating things about that is that it was very carefully targeted um, to reach precisely those neglected post-industrial areas um, that have been so uh, ravaged by, by the last 30 years of neoliberal policy. Um, so there is support for those policies and uh, polling found that actually support for those policies increased um, after the election campaign. So the conversation now in this sort of post-election analysis um, of what Labour should do is, is very much around whether to preserve that, whether the party should stay on that left-wing path, um, or you know, other factions of the party saying, well, self-evidently self that failed, uh, and should, we should tack more towards a centre position. And, and that will be, to conclude with this, I guess that, that will take place when Labour decides whose new leader is. That's where that battle will be seen in public. Absolutely. Um, so the, one of the things that happened after Jeremy Corbyn became leader was that the membership surged um, to now just after half a million people. And they are the ones who vote for the leadership. Um, and they are the ones, in fact, who voted for Jeremy Corbyn to be the party leader twice. So they their influence is still considerable. Um, and that's something that you know, it's understood that all the candidates now throwing their hat into the ring for the leadership contest, it's, it's understood that they need to have that membership on side. And let's not forget that that membership is, you know, what's so impressive about the Labour Party is its ground game. Certainly 2017 was very um, inf influential, but it, it, if you have a membership that that's, is that big and has that sense of buy-in, to the Labour Party as a project, then it is them willing to go and canvas, you know, street by street, house by house, and 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 have that conversation uh, with communities and on doorsteps that is that is so needed um, to engage people with the Labour movement. So, I would imagine that people who are looking at the leadership position now will have an eye on that membership and what its preferences are, but at the same time. Obviously, very important. The failure of uh, Labour in this last election was to was to persuade people of that argument. It may have had policies that people liked, but people were not persuaded uh, by any means that Labour could or would deliver those policies, and and that's the challenge going forward. Well, there's so much more to talk about here. So I look forward in the coming year to. Uh having conversations just about what happens when the, the, the center and the left seem to be in one political grouping and taking on the right, which is rising in power, then what to do next and where does this take uh, the struggle for this new century? Um, and I look forward to conversations about that and many more with you, Rachel. Thank you so much for your work and thank you uh, for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Let us know what you think. Take care. <laughs>